Maduric from uh, University of Banja Luka announced her um, uh, missing uh, from this uh, uh, presentation. So I invite now uh, Mrs. Uh, Miss Caroline Ledan from uh, Scola Campesina in uh, Italy, Europe. Please. Mm. Um, okay. Hello. Okay. I'm Thank here. you. I am trying to share my screen. Okay, it's done. <clears throat> So I am Caroline Ledon. I am um, from this uh, Scola Campesina organization. We are based in Italy and we focus mainly our activities on the global governance of food and agriculture. So today I will speak about um, the political aspect of uh, seeds, let's say, but uh, under the treaty, because there are so, ma so many things to say on the political aspect of, the, of seeds. Uh, I will uh, present you this uh, treaty, though, so the International Treaty on Plant Genetic Resources for Food and Agriculture, which has this very important article on farmers' rights. So it's really the recognition of uh, the rights of food producers to their seeds, to conserve their seeds, to sell them, to exchange. So it's, it's really, it's not a small issue regarding biodiversity. And uh, it has been said before by uh, other speakers. Um, so agricultural bi biodiversity, as we know it today, it has been a long, very long process um, done by uh, food producers all along the years and along the history which identify interesting characteristics in plants and animals to reproduce them and get better yields and more tasty food and so on. Um, I think that Dr. Joshi made a very exhaustive list of these characteristics that can be um, yeah, reproduced by food producers. And it's a yeah, very, very rich agro agricultural biodiversity that we have uh, today, and as you have seen, it's treated. Oh. I'm trying to switch slides. Okay, this way. So yeah, it's today treated, and it's actually a very important uh, issue which deserves uh, much more uh, political attention. Uh, it's it's not about only about environment. It's also about the legacy that we give to next generations and it's about our culture and it's a huge um, it's a huge uh, issue which is much broader than just an environmental interest so the treaty international treaty on plant genetic resources for food and agriculture it has been uh, endorsed in 2001 entered into force in 2004 by fao conference and it has been a very long struggle of more than 20 years um, from civil society organization and uh, okay. social movement, farmers organization to defend the right of farmers to preserve and um, using and exchanging and selling their seeds. So at the very end, at the end of these 20 years, okay, we got this interesting uh, international instrument, but Unfortunately, um, there is a lack of implementation at national level, and uh, we will see it later. It's um, it's a pity regarding all these efforts and uh, all these uh, negotiations and um, conversation among states to 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 find the right uh, instruments and the benefit uh, sharing. Um, on the genetic resources. Uh, yeah, we will uh, talk about this later. So the treaty is really is potentially a very good instrument to save and to protect biodiversity. It's obvious that the cultivated the agricultural biodiversity will be uh, well defended if the treaty could have been applied or would be applied. 
but it's also the case for the wild biodiversity. As we have seen also uh, by uh, previous speakers, that the protection of habitats is really an issue and protecting small scale food production is also protecting habitats and just um, preserving wild biodiversity regarding monoculture and large scale, uh, yeah, large scale production, which goes beyond, uh, which goes along um, habitat uh, destruction, like deforestation and so on. So the, um, yeah, the treaty is, when we speak about the nexus between the tr this treaty and biodiversity, it's obvious that at the center, we have the food producers. And because farmers do rely on biodiversity for their production, for their livelihoods, but they are also the main agent, as I mentioned it uh, before. So for example, let's, let's take an example, but the speakers previously have been talking about this also, that if you have a field of corn planted by industrial seeds, and without peasant knowledge uh, involved, the individuals are genetically exactly the same. And, and by the way, it requires also um, chemicals. They have been designed to receive chemicals and pesticides and fertilizers. And, but on the contrary, in, in most of uh, small scale farmers gardens, individuals, have very uh, great intra variety, um, in, intra diversity, sorry, by a biodiversity within the species and heterog heterogeneity. So we gain, I mean, this is easy to understand, I think. And this, is, this has been recognized by the treaty. So the important role of food producers in uh, this uh, dynamic management of uh, the cultivated plants. So it's, um, it's a huge uh, improvement, let's say, in the, on the side of the recognition, the symbolic recognition. Um, yeah, I like this quote because it's saying about the, the future and that seeds really represent the past that we have. And uh, it's a legacy for the present and the future. Um, so it's a quote from La Via Campesina, the main uh, food producers union. I would like also to highlight the fact that um, the recognition of uh, this role of food producers um, is protecting uh, food producers in their activities of maintaining and developing biodiversity and doing so it also protects us as consumers i mean our, as a population um, through the right to food and this is not always obvious to see the link between uh, biodiversity and food food producers um, maintenance of biodiversity and the right to food so the fact that the, there is a multiplicity Hopefully, we still have a very large basis of food producers around the world. The fact that there are so many people uh, farming is a guarantee of the right to food to be, um, I mean, to applied. Um, imagine if we had just one, two, or three companies providing food for everyone, we would have food security, but we would be very worried and concerned about uh, the food provision. So um, it's the, the farmers that feed us, they are also the ones that maintain the agricultural biodiversity and that guarantee this right to food. And at the same time, they are really poorly supported by food policies, by policies in general. So. And the treaty, as well as the newly adopted instrument uh, of the United Nations, UNDROP, United Nations Declaration on the Right of Peasants and Other People Living in Rural Area, as well as the, the CBD, the Nagoya Protocol, and so on, are very interesting instruments to protect their activities and our right to food. Um, 
I will now stop talking for two minutes. I would like you to hear from um, a farmer women from Zimbabwe, from Zimsof organization. And so Zimsof is an organization of food producers in Zimbabwe organizing, organizing um, seed fair and so on. And I think it would be interesting to have her voice on this issue. As a woman, I have to ensure there is enough food for my family, food that is nutritious and wholesome. I don't buy seeds from the shops. I am a strong believer in farm seed. I am sorry, this is my fault. I'm a strong believer in farm seed that we have selected and they used it for a long time. Our selection methods depend on various factors such as resistance to drought and their reliance to the crops despite the poor rains. Some crops we grow for the virus, for the various reasons, or compost or composite use. For example, we grow certain kinds of beans in order to have relish. In relish, we use the leaves of the beans. And the beans itself, we use it as food. The crops we grow are a result of years of in situ experiments that have handed results and have been proved reliable over the past generations. Our organization is trying to revive these crops and has embarked on to encourage farmers to collect and produce these forgotten crops. I, I hope you heard, you, you could hear it. Um, thank you for, for being patient and hearing to, to Zukolule. Um, I think it's important to have this kind of uh, um, wisdom and um, from the um, from a farmer woman that she's starting her, her speech saying as a woman i am responsible for the nutrition i don't remember exactly but to give nutritious food to my family and this is the case of um, many many women around the world being uh, carried of this task of uh, feeding the family in a nutritious way but i want to highlight it here because the role of women in the in the global, in the international instruments and uh, literacy, it's always um, it's always present because now gender issues are always uh, there, but usually as a chapter or as a end note. Or, and um, when we speak about biodiversity and right to food, the role of women is extremely important um, and should be acknowledged as central. Um, Okay, so this was the point of this slide. Now going back to farmers' rights, I will put it uh, maybe bigger, yeah. So as I said, it's the, this article in the treaty is the recognition of the importance of the dynamic management of biodiversity by, by food producers. So it's a reference that can be um, of many of a great utility when uh, speaking with uh, governments and we can advocacy, as well as for uh, food producers themselves to be at the end acknowledging this important role and being um, proud of it. Um, okay, this has been uh, said. Uh, just a word on the context. So 
when um, negotiating this treaty, when negotiating this treaty, there were a huge um, attempt from the seed companies to defend their so-called rights, no, of uh, the genetic materials that they discovered. Um, actually, they just have the technical, the technology to um, to extract genetic genetic material and to make profit out of it. And in this context, um, social movement, farmers' organization gathers gathered and said, "Okay, we need also to defend our rights." So this is why they created this concept of farmers' rights to seed. But in a normal and a, in a normal world, if I mean, if this attempt from seed companies uh, were not existing, then this concept would, would not exist neither. It's really to face this um, attack and to defend uh, their rights as it was threatened. I will not, I will not go in deep in the in the article just to mention that. Um, the this um, oh sorry article uh, nine point two that uh, saying that it's the national governments that are responsible for the application of the treaty and uh, this is uh, really part of the problem because it's the treaty being binding it's not implemented and um, so it's important for the, on the symbol aspect but it's really poorly implemented so far um, this is why uh, I put this quote it's uh, really an important aspect when dealing with the treaty the um, the seed industry could benefit of the treaty because they had access more easily access to these resources but the benefit sharing never happened. There are no payment for um, this uh, genetic material extracted from the south. And, um, and the national government do not uh, apply what is in this treaty and uh, regarding farmers' rights. So it's uh, also mentioned here that um, there is a, a a work done to improve its functioning, but five years later, when uh, they published this article, there was no no outcome of this negotiation, unfortunately. So biodiversity uh, is really closely linked to to the culture, and it created livelihoods for so many. It's closely linked to nutrition. It's also um, what is. Um, food producers do uh, provide local markets out of the cultivated biodiversity that they maintain in their fields. And it's also closely linked to this uh, dynamic at local level, uh, to territories, to, to women's rights, as we mentioned it. And it's an uh, important, important heritage. Also knowledge is at the center of biodiversity. Uh, I just had a, a report from Turkey with a 19 uh, young guy wishing to farm and uh, leaving the city, he wanted to start farming. And he just went to the conventional farming because no knowledge was available. He was no out of a, a farming family and he was just wishing to start farming and being uh, in a village. So he, without knowledge, it's really hard to be independent from the extension services uh, that are provided, um, at, which are so often uh, for the conventional farming, which uh, do not foster biodiversity, nor wild, nor cultivated. And knowledge is really important in a mountain context everywhere, but here in a, where the, the living condition is not easy, uh, people are really relying on their knowledge to cultivate. And um, the role of women is also extremely important, holding uh, an important part of this traditional knowledge and seeds. And so the traditional varieties are uh, preserved because they are a source of 
nutrition and they are well adapted to these conditions. Uh, I'm not an expert at all on the mountains. This is why I, I rely on this um, study here because this is an online school about mountains. So I wanted to have this approach, but I will not speak too much because I'm not an expert on this. But it's clear here and elsewhere that uh, adaptable, adapted seeds, traditional varieties, um, and the, the process of adapting year by year the seeds in situ is really, really important of, in the context of climate change. And uh, this is one of the current challenges that we face, as you know, it's, uh, it's obvious, but also another challenge is um, the disappearance of um, local knowledge here in, um, I personally live here now in France. Uh, my organization is based in Italy. I am originally from Belgium. And this part of uh, the world in the Western countries, local knowledge is not easy to find. <laughs> and we lost a lot, a lot of, uh, of knowledge. And my grandmother was teached by her granddaughter how to grow food. Then she moved to the city after the war, the second war. And then we lost uh, the knowledge. This is the case for many, many families. And, but this threat is also happening in other parts of the world, as uh, it has been also mentioned by a previous speaker. Uh, there is an enormous concentration, um, economical concentration, specifically in the seed sector. It's now really getting crazy. The, the, merge, the mergers that we, that we have in this sector, and this, is, this go hand with, um, how do you say, hand in hand with um, the digitalization of the economy, which really push for this concentration. And now uh, companies are making profit, not from the genetic material, from the plant. Now they are using, um, genetic material uh, uh, built on the, on, on the computer. We are, we are going in a very uh, virtual world, which is also threatening uh, um, local biodiversity. Now FAO is really taking this uh, trend and uh, pushing for more digitalization and high tech uh, in agriculture. And we see it as a very, dangerous. This is uh, from a report that is about to be published by um, FAO and our organization. In a few days, it will be available. It's on the monitoring uh, system on um, the biodiversity in Eastern Europe and Central Asia. And uh, I take the opportunity of this uh, conversation to say that we are making a list of uh, monitoring systems of bi agricultural biodiversity. And it's obvious that it will not be exhaustive. We are trying to collect the initiatives. And um, so if you are aware of an initiative, uh, we will have an online uh, dynamic list so it can be filled in uh, during the, the coming month. And I'm happy to, to welcome new initiatives in this list. So coming back to all, I'm all, um, almost finished, huh? don't worry. <laughs> so the increasing economy activity uh, based on genetic material really uh, is bringing dangerous threat on biodiversity. And one of these threats is the um, commercialization of a set of super genes that like uh, a genetic material, which is super interesting theori th theoretically but that could really damage local ecosystems if introduced. And that can lead to the generalization of um, this uh, standard chain in many parts of the world. So this is an example of the, of the, the risk um, held by um, the economic activity on the genetic based on genetic materials. So the treaty, as well as the um, declaration of the UN on 
um, the right of peasants and other people living in the rural area, as well as the CBD and the Nagoya Protocol, they are all trying to regulate um, the use of genetic materials. But um, the digitalization is going so fast that we, so far there is no legal instrument to regulate the digitalization in agriculture. I will not go into detail in the NROP, that is highly interesting. I want just to finish my presentation saying that it's seeds are a matter of human rights. The rights to use it, the right to exchange and to sell it is really uh, threatened. And it's, um, let's say, um, a condition for biodiversity to be maintained and to be developed. So the policies are sometimes very in contradiction, no? saying that we need to meet the SDGs to address the climate change and at the same time not uh, supporting uh, farmers' rights. Uh, human rights in agriculture is, uh, is uh, translated by the concept of food sovereignty and agroecology is part of food sovereignty. Agroecology is really is um, a way of a way of cultivating, but based on uh, food producers' knowledge, with a, a respectful way of dealing with nature, uh, based on its own capacity to deal with its uh, challenges, and it's uh, of course a matter of autonomy, resilience, and of local agrobiodiversity. I will um, finish my presentation here. So saying that biodiversity is a matter of human rights and I'm welcoming any comments and uh, questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Caroline, uh, for your presentation, your delicate, uh, let's say, lobby for, um, for the national governments to apply the um, what the treaties, uh, what the existing treaties are already mentioning and um, for um, adapting uh, the choice of um, seeds and uh, cultures to local specificity and uh, in, to ensure the uh, agricultural biodiversity. So thank you for your uh, well-documented presentation. And, um, now it's the time for delegates' presentations. I uh, understand from Dr. Hasrat that uh, we have one delegate that announced uh, uh, his or her missing. Um, but uh, I now invite Mr. Shubham Singh uh, to uh, take the floor and um, present uh, the information prepared for this uh, technical session. So, Mr. Shubham Singh. Yes, ma'am. Am, okay. am I audible, ma'am? Yes, thank you. You've just uh, shared your uh, your screen. Just yes, uh, just uh, to make it full screen, please. Thank you. Can I start, ma'am? Yes, please. Yes, you are full screen now. Thank you. You yeah. have 10 minutes, as you might already know. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Uh, respected chairs, co-chairs, delegate participants, and learner participants, good evening to one and all present here. I'm going to draw your attention towards my work on the soil uh, indices and uterine management through Ajola integration in this also. So we moving further towards the top to draw your attention towards this topic when we first came in our mind that there is a lot of work in this nitrogen and ajola uh, thing so here from my work i want mainly on the soil acidity problems mainly phosphorus needs reduction by ajola so we know that is one of the major constraint in crop production throughout the world it affect around 3.95 billion hectare area. 
in india one third of the land affected by soil acidity so soil acidity influence the chemical and biological reactions that control the plant nutrient availability and toxicity of the some elements and it also have a constraint in the crop productivity so it's very important and the need of the earth to manage the soil acidity and go for the crop productivity improvement moreover we also know that uh, for uh, uh, improving the soil acidity we are using liming so and that is also a it's not economic it's a, it's very expensive so we can go for any alternative like ajola uh, which have a very high nitrogen fixing in soil acidity there are several ind indices which is used to correct the soil acidity for the ma maximizing of the crop yield these in indices include ph acidity saturations and lot more so keeping in this Consideration. Uh, I determine two gives mainly to study the effect of nitrogen and phosphorus through urea and the yield of rice and also on the soil acidity indices. I formulated six treatments with one uh, with soil application of urea and and the rest related treatment with ajola. So when we look on the first table on the effect of the uh, on the yield we found out that grain yield differs significantly among the treatments there are around 17% increase in the grain yield when we compared t5 treatments with the t3 and also there is a significant increase when we compare with the t6 and t4 if you look in the nitrogen concentration here also we can find that there is a 22% increase in the t6 where it is a uh, integrated treatments of ajola and urea when it compared to the control it is mainly because of the improved plant health and accelerating plant growth processes and also by the application of the nutrient through organic sources for ajola it had better availability to nitrogen due to narrow cn ratio which help in the mineralization of the nitrogen and it enhances activity of the microbes which play role in the of the nutrient cycling to a better uptake of the plant release organic acid if we look in nitrogen here also there is a 53% increase in the straw concentration phosphorus concentration in the straw when we compared t integrated treatment over the control here uh, the reason most probably the reason will be the organic uh, forming the chillet with aluminum and iron in acid which result in the low phosphorus fixing capacity also it is due to the synergist, uh, synergistic effect of the nitrogen and phosphorus and the production of organic acid during decomposition also helps in real, uh, this mineralization of the phosphorus if you look for the production the results mainly for grain and straw is not significant but for the uptake there is a significant results when we compared it with the t6 and t5 Uh, means the uh, integrated treatments of urea and ajola with the control uh, it's due to the and uh, due to the good proliferation of the root system resulted in the better adsorption of the k and also it is due to the priming effect priming effect is that uh, when ajola on decomposition it releases organic acid which solubilizes the native and fixed and non exchangeable form of k which uh, on the later stage will available to the crop growth so here if we see the organic effect on the organic here we can see the treatment uh, which is the t6 treatment have better and uh, organic carbon percentage with the time, uh, time available when we see on the 30 60 90 and at maturity over the and here the mainly 
the effect of urea soil acidity indices and here we can see that and treated plot have more organic carbon because of more biomass and also in combination with the urea which enhance root growth leading to accumulation of the more organic residue in the soil for ph we can see that it is a non significant but then also slight increase in the ph as compared to initial value initial ph ph was around 5.12 so decrease in the ph of urea plot it due to the acidic residual nature and if we see for the exchangeable aluminum and exchangeable acidity we see that in t2 treatments which is the sole application treatment of the urea has lowest as compared to the other treatment it's because of the proton consuming ability of the humic materials and have reduced acidity in this case so this reduction explained by the steady formation of the organic materials with functional groups such as carboxylic and phenolic group during decomposition and low solubility of the calcium carbonate similarly exchangeable calcium magnesium also we can see that azola have values due to the high concentration of the organic matter in this result in the high biomass and it is same as cc so at last i conclude that the combined application of the azola with nitrogen significantly increase the grain straw yield over the sole applications and integration of with urea was found most appropriate maximum production of the paddy in acidic soil therefore uh, the pollination in acidic soil for paddy production it is recommended to farmers uh, thank you and i conclude my presentation here thank you for sharing with us